one of the most fucked up scenes in all of cinema. I can't believe that I used to watch this every day, and I can't believe that it was signed off on. And if you want to know why The Brave Little Toaster isn't on Disney+, Plus, this is why. Good morning, good morning, good morning. That was a billion and one strings playing one of your all-time favorite tunes. Hey, how's it going? I'm really excited about my book. It's about growing up with ADHD, its medications, and my experience and relationship with those medications. Check out the book. We're gonna talk about a movie, a 90s kid. I used to hang out at the mall, go rollerblading. Dippin' Dots were really amazing. I learned about, I learned about oral sex in fifth grade with Bill Clinton. I'm a 90s kid. I used to play Goldeneye in the basement, get pizza. When I was a little kid, I had this big east-facing window and the sun would rise and I woke up with the sun off and I woke up early. When I woke up, I had, you know, maybe two hours before school and this time was usually spent catching a flick downstairs on a VHS tape. There was probably 10 or 12 movies that I would watch pretty regularly. The Sandlot, big Care Bears movie where a kid goes super demon on everybody and a couple other flicks I'm not remembering right now. But the one flick that I think I watched the most was The Brave Little Toaster. I can't remember exactly why I love this movie so much, but I'm gonna watch it and see what comes up when I watch it. The reason I liked it might have been because every song in it is a straight banger. Van Dyke Parks and David Newman, you guys blew it out of the park with the music. They were given an opportunity to make really cool music about a story of five inanimate objects traversing the world and breaking free from the limitations of their own selves in accordance with this messianic character, the master that they are searching for, for to bring back meaning and purpose into their lives. But the music is straight bangers. I can see places in the narrative <laughs> that are just are hilarious, like the conspiracy theorist Eric and Desher. Just how much darkness is in this movie and how I would never share it with my kids, but how it's a great story. I do want to talk about the author and his life. I will do that at the end, so stick around. This is weird. It's much worse than I feared. This is weird. It's much worse than I feared. Now, in Scattered Minds by Gabo Mate, he presents the idea that ADD, ADHD is based both on hereditary and environment. That it's neither one exclusively, but it's a combination of inherited traits with the environment you grew up in. He says, he refers to this um, invisible environment in your home. He says, the invisible environment has little to do with parenting philosophies or parenting style. It's a matter of intangibles. Kind of the idea that, that a certain environment on a certain individual will create expressions of ADD throughout uh, experience and almost um, making those things that stress will put someone in a stress response. And this movie is stressful. <laughs> it's a big stretch to say this movie gave me ADHD, but uh, it was. it's one of the intangible elements of my life was regularly exposing to myself, uh, getting a dose of the energy of this film <laughs> regularly was kind of a crazy thing or an interesting thing. And I mean, I'm thinking that that was my screen time was just this time with the movie. But uh, now the children who are growing up now, if they were to make a video essay like this in 30 years, they would be talking about the profound effect daily scrolling may have had on them and a certain account that they may have scrolled and they'll reflect on it the way I'm about to reflect on this film that I watched. I'm not trying to say like the most traumatic thing that ever happened to me as a kid was I watched Brave Little Toaster regularly. I was really lucky and privileged. I had the safety and accessibility that every morning I could just relax and uh, watch a story. Yeah, I think now I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking about it and I'm gonna watch it. It's incredible hand-drawn art and the way they apply a filmic look to the introduction is incredible. It just creates a sense of emptiness in this house. And then we meet our protagonist, the sun rising on his face. In the beginning, there was light. It's really good. It starts out with a little fight between the radio and the lamp that is just, it's so funny. It's so good. The radio, the radio is so funny. Incredible work with character development. We meet this air conditioner who can't even cough out anything. We meet the diligent vacuum cleaner and toaster. Wanting to toast bread, but there's nobody there making bread. The toaster is a machine that wants to work. They have a small argument about work and if work is fun or if work is work. There's only one rule. You can't stop till the house is clean. And then they listen to Tutti Frutti and have a really good time cleaning up the house. So then everything stops when the blanket 
The one who's sensitive senses something. A car. A car. A car. A car. They all think that this might be it. You know, they they have a really they see this like the Messiah, like they've been praying for this every day for the return of the Master, and and it's just amazing that the only human who exists in the world of these things is the Master. You know, the blanket starts hallucinating, really, this scene. And just when you look at it, it's just like this crazy, there's a, everything looks so beautiful. And look at the parents' silhouette. That's it from them. Mom has a huge nose. All he wants to do is, is wrap this, is just be warm on this kid. And I mean, seeing that blanky master scene, I, I had a blanket that I loved, you know? That was really that childhood innocence that the blanket has. I'm watching this as a child. It's telling me that the love I have for my blanket's gonna go away one day. The cry of the blanket was so real. And then they start fighting over the picture. The vacuum, who's like old and curmudgeonly, calls the blanket a wimp. And wimp! And they break the picture. And this kind of like breaks their spirit. And this is when they introduce what I think is one of the most intense characters of this film, which is full of really, really intense characters. The air conditioner. He berates them for their love of the master. Is this Phil Hartman? He's a total, like... This, he's presenting this philosophy of just fuck everything. Everything sucks. He's not coming back and who gives a shit if he does anyways. Fuck everything. This guy is so angry. The air conditioner delivers the best lines about them being machines. Come right off the assembly line through your chrome and then um, a collective wattage instead of collective IQ. It's crazy. But then the air conditioner gets real defensive when the toaster accuses him of being jealous. And then when Kirby brings up that he's stuck in the wall. Because you're stuck in the wall. Which I don't know if it's like a handicap to them or what, but it strikes, a, you know, it, it, it uh, blows a fuse. So it's back to that stupid static again. You think I don't know what's going on in here? He accuses the cottage of having a conspiracy against him. It's a conspiracy. And he's paranoid that all the other things, then he's calling them low watts because the air conditioner does take more voltage than everything else. And he has, he's demonstrating so much cold and isolation, being stuck in the wall. He's a guy who can't take it anymore. This is literally me. Just kidding. He's totally losing it as to his purpose. If what you know that he so much struggles with accepting who he is, that he's angrily comforting himself. This is insane for a four or five year old to watch. <laughs> I watched it all the time. He says, "It's my function." It's my function. No. He can't help it, and then he dies. He angered himself to death. In the aftermath of that, another car shows up and it's somebody parking their car, pulling right up to the cabin. And they start hearing this hammering. It's putting up a for sale sign. No one's coming. And then, what? We're going out to find him. What? what? We're not just gonna sit around and wait for this kid to come back. It's been years. Let's get out of here. The scene is insane. This is crazy idea. Why, if only we were all wiener dogs, our problems would be solved. And then the, the radio tells a story of a dog that uh, was left behind on a fishing trip and found his way back home 300 miles. This gives him some hope, you know? And this points out something I feel like is, is what really sets the movie apart, but also lets them go to lengths that they shouldn't, I believe, and we'll get to those later. The objects, they're seen as, you know, totally anthropomorphic. They talk, they walk, they, they're, they're human beings inside of these things, more or less, in the same way that um, animals were anthropomorphized, like in The Lion King or something like that, that for all the other cartoons I watched, you know, Five o Goes West, whatever, Little, The Lady and the Tramp, you know, it's, it's animals that are drawn that talk. In this one, the qualities that are normally attributed to a group of animals are attributed to a group of objects. If you imagine them as animals, it feels really different. And then they start thinking of different ways that they can go now that they've decided that they're, they, they're going to go with the master after, after that pep talk. The lamp is ADD for sure. The blanket is like totally emotionally disordered. And the toaster has grandiose narcissistic idea. The radio, I don't know, the radio is pretty got shit together. And then, you know, the vacuum's angry and resentful and they have a good time. They hook it up with a car battery. It says Junko on it. And then they get out of there. The master is their guide and they open the door and they go into the unknown. I mean, it's an awesome collective hero's journey right here. 
oh man, I just got goosebumps, you know? They're doing it. And that's a beautiful thing too. They see the sun as a big lamp and then they, they go out into the world. They just go for it. Life is like a journey on a road that's within. Head says you should stay, but your heart says to begin. So you go, but you don't wanna go. They're saying time flies by in the city of life. Time stands still in the country. Because where they are, they're disconnected from reality. They're disconnected from everything. And I'd be satisfied just to be not denied to reside with some pride. What a ride to the city, the city of life. Blanket is, I think, the one who really loves the master the most. Anytime they forget, like, their purpose, you know, that you know, Kirby would often bring up, like, this is stupid, why are we doing this? And the blanket always comes back with Kirby with, like, we do this for the master. They said the master will open the gate to the city of light. It's pretty religious. You know, the, the lamp says he's a man with a plan. The toaster says he's a man of great reflection. And the radio says he's a man with his hand on the, like, across the land. But Kirby doesn't actually say anything about the master. He hasn't shared his affection for him. The kid probably didn't vacuum the floor. It's really wholesome. And then they start, things start looking dark pretty quickly. They, they end up in a, just like in thorns and bushes and sticks. They fight a lot with each other. The blanket is so desperate for affection. The first night out there, the toaster blows him off for snuggling. And then they come across indigenous beings. They come across frogs. And they're total strangers in this world. Manufactured objects that, that come across an absolute natural oasis. They stumble into the Garden of Eden. And then all these mice come up to the blanket and he's finally, or he or she, the blanket's super non-binary, but the toaster starts getting really tired of all the frogs looking at their reflection. The toaster brings the gift of self-awareness. Is The toaster runs away from all the squirrels that are trying to look at it and he finds this shaft of light just beaming on this tender and beautiful yellow, I don't know, daffodil, tulip, beautiful flower. The tulip reaches out to him for snuggles because this lonely flower thinks it's finally found another flower. I'm not, I'm not a flower. And when the thing goes for a hug, the toaster's like disgusted with the affection. It's so weird. And then the toaster watches back as the flower withers and dies. And I, I've heard some stuff that this is like, the yellow is that of the blanket and because he's working on the relationship he has with the blanket. But he climbs this hill and turns around, like he experiences that grief of, like uh, killing someone by not loving them. And then the toaster under duress like saves the blanket from the mice and, and uh, you see this moment of affection with the, to the blanket where that scene, that experience with the, the grief of losing that f flower helped the toaster reconcile his like blockage with being loving toward the blanket. It's really subtle, but that, that's, I mean, that's storytelling, man. And then when they start making fun of the, the blanket for being scared later, you know, the toaster comforts. So although the toaster went through something painful, and the toaster was a traumatic experience for the flower, he grew from that pain because he got a reflection of himself in the flower the same way the flower got a reflection of itself in the toaster. He saw what he was doing, or she, or he, I'm not sure. Forgive me for the pronouns, I don't know. Saw what, that, what he's doing, damn. The toaster saw that what the toaster was doing to the flower was hurting it. When I was a little kid, I always thought they were all boys because I was a little boy. I'm gonna take a break from my watching here. So when I return, it might be different lighting and different clothes. I know it's moving along, but I'm getting tired. And I'm gonna go lay down and read Dubliners. More good writing. In Dubliners by James Joyce, on like the second page. So when I was a nipper, every morning of my life, I had a cold bath, winter and summer. James Joyce, confirmed ice bath bra. <laughs> Greetings. I'm back, although I was gone for no amount of time in your perception. Since we last left, our heroes are in the woods, arguing once again, as they regularly do. Uh, since then, I, I, I got tired. I started reading Dubliners by James Joyce. I went to bed. I woke up. I had breakfast. I had coffee. And now I'm continuing this very important video essay on the Brave Little Toaster. I did find it curious that um, when I opened up Dubliners, they were discussing in the first story, The Sisters, um, a boy had seen a man paralyze and have a stroke, much like perhaps the air conditioner. There was a line that I wanted to highlight because it felt relevant to this. It's bad for children, said old Cotter, because their minds are so impressionable. Whenever children see things like that, you know, it has an effect. 
And that's kind of the reason I'm reaching as far as I can that this has to do with ADD is because it's almost like every morning before school, I was putting myself in a stressful situation by watching this film. I was putting, there's a lot of stress in this film. Um, there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of fighting amongst the characters. There's, as we'll see, there's a lot of blatant violence and threatening of life. So these are some pretty heavy themes for a five or six year old, which is what I was when I watched this. We have Leo Tolstoy's, you should only love one thing in yourself, that which is the same in all of us. In loving that which is the same in all of us, you love God. Master, look at that. Here I was wondering if there was going to be any connection to Brave Little Toaster. And right here we have Master. The, as I've been comparing, the religious deity, the Messiah of these five pilgrims is this boy, the master. And then the blanket finally gets a moment when they're out in the woods to provide something other than worry and emotional. You know, the blanket, he always, they bring him along, but really the only thing he provides is uh, praises of the master and he complains and he's, he's a, he needs a tag along, but he finally makes himself useful and becomes a tent for everyone to sleep in, and that gives him real happiness and comfort that he can support his his brethren. Yes, I am gendering them all as he. I, I it's it's in my from childhood. And at this, they finally they finally have some comfort, and they finally they feel good. You know, I think that they're showing that they're getting settled in their pilgrim life, as they are uh, righteous pilgrims. Subplot of the the toaster and the blankets. Nur nurturing relationship 3815 trying to the, the the lamp is trying to understand the love that they have that the, the toaster is showing to the blanket and when the toaster explains it he said oh like the love for the master they're they're god really so the toaster is learning how to love each other the way he loves the divine i think i know what you're talking about and he calls the toaster a slot head. good night slot head I'm going to say that this is the, one of the most fucked up scenes in all of cinema. I can't believe that I used to watch this every day, and I can't believe that it was signed off on. And if you want to know why The Brave Little Toaster isn't on Disney+, Plus, this is why. If it wasn't this scene, this this scene, the amount of cortisol that this scene produces in a child um, is probably remarkable. And if stress can cause distractibility and ADD and inflammation, and that happened to me, then... This scene might be the reason I became an amphetamine addict in the long run. I don't know. That's a big stretch, but I'm, I'm trying to tie it into my um, my book and stuff. I really just want to, uh, I don't know. So in the scene, it starts with the, the kid happy with the toaster. And the, this is the toaster's dream, and he's recalling the time he felt most happy when he could just provide sustenance for this kid and allow the kid to see himself as a, as with youth, vigor, and happiness. But then all of a sudden, the room begins to fill with black smoke. The toast is burning. And then the smoke turns into a hand that grabs the boy and takes him away. So, you know, as a child, I'm identifying with the boy. And that's one of the scariest things I've ever seen. It's just a faceless hand large enough to grab my body and just pulls me out of my comfort. And then, and then they introduce one of the scariest cartoon clowns I've ever seen who delivers one of the most frightening lines I've ever heard in a movie. It's like, this is like the shining level of terror. He has a fork and, and a fire hose. So the clown is holding two of the most deadly weapons there is against a toaster. There's something about a villain who's calm. And the toaster runs and the, the, the clown just quietly starts spraying water at him. And the water as the, is catching up, and it becomes this wave, and the crest of the wave becomes forks. And then without any transition, we find him holding on with his little flaps above a bathtub. Now this is a symbol of, of, of this is a symbol of ending life. Look at this this long high shot of this crazy red bathroom. Now children, we don't know, we shouldn't know as children that people end their lives by taking a bath with the toaster. It's so tragic, it's so scary, and I can't believe this is in a kid's movie. And then you just hear the, the evil laughter. <laughs> and the toaster falls in the water, and that's what wakes him up, which is scary. It's just a total nightmare. And they wake up to a storm. And I mean, what that, that might have symbolized was just the toaster's fear of losing touch with everything and, and everything falling apart, which is a valid fear for the character at the time. But outside of just the 
the the narrative, which it does a good job of continuing. This is some really frightening imagery for children. And this is something even in James Joyce's time, they were saying, we should protect kids from what they see. It, it sticks in them deeply. It will jar them in the future. It will change their perception of reality as they move forward. And, you know, movies are powerful and that. Uh, yeah. And then immediately he wakes up in the blanket, the new, like, so now it's almost like the toaster was showing his love for the blanket and was criticized by the lamp for doing this. So now now that the blanket has been uh, windswept into the trees in the, in the storm, the lamp does something really brave because their battery's dead. And the lamp climbs up a tree and reaches out for the thunder and light and sacrifices himself for his group. He puts his neck on the line, but the battery is so charged that it's glowing. And the next day we see they're still looking for the blanket and the lamp survives, but he's, he's beat up. And then Kirby, the curmudgeon of the group, climbs a tree by sucking his own wire and gets the blanket down. Despite scaring the pants off most kids watching this film, they are bonding the characters and allowing them to, to get along with one another. I don't know, it's through all their plight and their strife, they end up getting along better. And Kirby refuses to, to collect any praise for helping. He's like, yeah, whatever, let's just keep going. We're wasting time, and it's a... Uh... I just cut it out, all of you. I only did it so we could be on our way. And then immediately, it's almost like a, as soon as one of these guys commits a folly of behavior, they're immediately met with a challenge that challenges that behavior. So right after Kirby is like, I don't care, nothing bothers me, whatever, let's just keep going. Freaking out, he just gets really nervous about water. Rightfully so. And then he has a seizure. Get the cord out of his mouth! You know, they're saying get the cord out of his mouth, don't let him swallow it. They're talking about when a person's having a seizure in their tongue. It's like, they're, they all these really, really grown up references. And Toaster switches him off. And then, and then Kirby freaks out. Lay off! Just lay off! He says, who needs you guys anyway? Who needs you guys anyway? And then they daisy chain their wires to cross a, like a waterfall, working as a team. And then Toaster starts, the Toaster starts freaking out. And I didn't realize this at the time, but this is almost like uh, the premonition of his dream. He's And then the, that fear allows him to drop the cord and they all fall into the waterfall. There's something about when, what you fear, you manifest. And then it's it's right there. Kirby was just saying, I'd be better off without you. I don't need any of you. He wishes they'd go away. They all went away. And now he's faced with the loneliness. What does he do? He leaps off that cliff to go help his friends. He cares. He didn't know he cared until he got what he thought he wanted. And then Kirby saves them all. Then they wash up in another dark, scary wood, you know, another forest of the unknown, except this time they don't have their rolling chair and their battery. They got to go on foot whatever foot is for them. And the toaster gets mad depressed, looking at his own reflection, which is super trippy. Toaster is tired of himself. I feel like more than a toaster, the toaster is a mirror, and they really go on its ability to reflect. Everyone and everything that comes across the toaster immediately sees themselves in the toaster. And it's almost the toaster couldn't stand his own distorted reflection. And then the vacuum slips and begins to sink into a bog, but all their, their, um, their cords are tied to Kirby, which reminds me of something in Moby Dick. Because in many ways, this story is like Moby Dick in that they are aboard on a journey that no one had asked them to take to look f for their white whale, which is the master. Chapter 72 of Moby Dick is called The Monkey Rope, and The Monkey Rope talks about how when you have to take the head off a whale, you actually have to tie yourself to your mate on the Pequod. Normally, they don't tie themselves, but that is to say that if, if you want to be... If you want to take care of me, I want to take care of you. And if you don't take care of me, you're coming down with me. We're in this together. We're tied together. And therefore, if I fall, the you saving me is saving yourself. They are tied together at the waist. Therefore, they, they have to look out for one another to a level of looking out for themselves. So it, it's a bond that all these characters are showing, much like the sailors on the Pequod, Moby Dick. What is the white whale? It's meaning, it's purpose. Because in the master, they want meaning, they want purpose, because the master gives them a reason to do things. They all go in the bog, and at this point, we're left to believe that this is the end. As soon as these these characters think they're out of the pot frying pan, they're in another fire. They think they're out of the fire, they're in an inferno. They just It just keeps getting worse for this group. As the radio dies, it plays this song, Mammy, I'm Coming, which is like, what is that song? One of the, the rare humans we meet is this guy. Um, he has like a chop shop for appliances. He, he repairs appliances, so you would think he's a good guy. 
It almost seemed that this guy goes to this bog regularly to collect appliances that fall into this trap or something. It doesn't make any sense what he was doing there, how he noticed a, a radio antenna and he knew for some reason that there was going to be free appliances in the bog. I do not understand why he was there. And Howard led to believe that he would have driven a monster truck into the woods to the precise location where all these appliances that he can use in his shop were sitting in wait, and then he can pull them up into his shop. It's like he, it's like he knows that appliance is looking for the master. They always go across this waterfall. They always come out this bog, and every Sunday he's there at ten in the morning to scoop them up and and sell them. And they're painting him out like a villain, but he's an appliance repairman. He really, he's just an appliance repairman. A customer comes by to the shop and asks for a blender motor. He's trying to repair his blender at home. And the blender is, is, is super afraid. But to this man, these appliances don't have these animalistic qualities that they do to us viewers, us children watching this. Now, this scene is so grotesque, and I think when watching it, it's important to also remember that as children, we're probably looking at these scenes like they're animals. And the way he treats the blender is so frightening. It, 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 it looks, you know, like live organ harvest. The way it squeezes in on the vice is, and just the brutality that they're all watching this man. It's like he's ripping out the heart of a rabbit, but super scary. But what the guy doing is totally honest. It's okay to take a motor out of a blender and give it to somebody if they want to repair their blender. But they're making it like, it's, like he's um, profiting on the murder of live beings. And our heroes are watching the blood drip off the handle. And then after that scene, we get one of, in my opinion, every, there's only like four or five songs in this movie, but each one is a certified grade A banger. I think that's what, that's why I watch this movie every day. It's just the songs are so good. As soon as their frightening song begins the lamp. Also, this super sexy reel to reel. I mean, geez. What is this song about? They are a house of corpses who are used for parts, who are sold, and their only value is disassembly. Telling them that it's like a movie. It's like a movie. Which is so weird, because we're watching a movie, and they're saying, actually, within this place, this space, this is like a movie, and it's like a B movie. It's a B movie show. Still a movie. But it's a B movie. It's not the choice. It's not where you want to be, but it's using a lot of spooky stuff. It's a B movie. And they show that this person that's a, a lamp, a shade, a razor, and a can opener that I guess the appliance repairman was goofing around trying to make up a new patent or something. God, I'm a fish mush. And then Kirby says the thing that I think we're all feeling about this movie. This is weird. And then the radio says, hey, it's much worse than I feared. And the lamp was to close his eyes and make it gone. I'll close my eyes and make it disappear. This movie has a lot to do with the discarding. It sort of is making this statement about obsolescence, capitalism, repair. So really, I mean, the repair shop, while it's tragic, they're using the material instead of uh, throwing it away. It's tough. It's a tough life, but it's a second life. It's a B movie. Your A movie is over, but at least you have the opportunity for a B, for a plan B, rather than being totally thrown away. And they have this really beautiful bridge in the song about the sun setting. Here comes the sun, here comes the night. The great lamp in the sky. Somebody tell me that fate has been kind. You can't go out. You must be out of your mind. You can't go out. You are out. These, these characters cannot get a break. This is, they're on an odyssey out here. All of a sudden, each of these villainous, broken, discarded appliances, they levitate on their cords while they're doing this vocal raise. And it always, to me, was like, Is this some kind of rapture? What is this? And then the same customer comes back and delivers one of the craziest lines in Sim and I have ever heard. Excuse me. The missus loved the blender motor, was wondering if you got some radio tubes too. And now it's the radio's turn. And the shopkeeper lies and says he got a shipment of radio tubes when in reality he stole one from his bog trap. Our faithful heroes do something that's never been done. They build themselves into kind of a weird ghostly effigy where the toaster is the face of this wrapped thing. So he's looking at himself and a creature and he totally flips out. And then he runs into a wall and passes out. 
Now, with this opportunity, they all run for it. They all liberate themselves from this appliance store. And the dog, who's kind of the intermediary between them, the dog, the dog, the dog, I don't really understand why the dog gets in the, the truck and leaves, almost to say that the dog is a victim as well, although he seemed to love his dog. Look at the way the reel to reel is holding on to, I can't see, it's behind the, the who is, ooh, the pencil sharpener. Did I catch you at a bad time? The customer didn't notice all the appliances run out. They got wheels again. They got a baby carriage. Where's Kirby? Kirby's probably pulling it. Yeah, Kirby's pulling it. Here's the man. Outside of all the traumatic shit, this movie is good. It's just PG-13. And they finally get out of that country appliance store and they're headed to a city. The City of Light. Time fly by in the City of Light. And we finally get an insight into where the master is and they've shown through a series of pictures that he's now a teenager and he's getting ready to go to college. We don't know where his father is. His mom is so sweet. She says, So let me worry a little bit. I'm, I'm your, your mother. mother. And him and his mom's apartment is really nice. He's going to the old cottage to pick up the lamp and some other stuff. So had they waited just like another few days and he's got like this friend, this cool girl, we see a conversation between his stereo and the table lamp. They're a little worried that they heard him talking about picking up the old radio and the old lamp because I think it's safe to say this movie paved the way for Toy Story. And I think they may have seen this movie and said, you're onto something. It might be better to do this with toys instead of these objects. Just a thought. And in the second Toy Story, you have the guy who works on toys and he's very much like the appliance shop owner. The brave little toaster walks so Toy Story could run. They find him in the phone book, as one does. So they come to the kid's apartment, the master, while well, the master actually returns to the cottage. So both of them aren't home for the other. And the modern appliances are frightened by the threat of the return of their predecessors. Again, they meet a new crew, a new tribe of appliances, whose friendliness comes with a taste of distrust and unsettling something wrong. The sewing machine, who is two and two appliances together, I guess one is the... Blanket. If you could actually call it a blanket, I'd rather die. Oh, it's just horrible something. and it smells John too. Get that thing away from me. Look at it. How could anybody want to deal with it? it? Oh, it's this disgusting. someone wash them? No, Lord, no. Ugh, I'm nauseous. Oh, how do you do? They're mean. They're met with the old television. And this is just interesting seeing this love for TV and we're watching a TV and the TV is communicated by a man with a mustache. And then the song is sung by the newer, the computer and the appliances sing to our heroes about how the future is coming and they will be becoming obsolete. The cutting, the cutting edge. edge. I've never seen contraptions with so many buttons and knobs and dials before. I mean, like, we're talking 1988 techno. What does that mean? Guys making the music for this movie, they were they were into it. Computer graphics locked into your memory. 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 It's evident, and the chorus of the song is. Everything you wanted and more. They're explaining to them that the comfort they provide is a replacement for a vacation. The food processor is belittling the toaster. And same with the toaster oven. Toaster can't make muffins. They drop two boats in a car in the living room and a jumbo jet. And the vacuum is made to feel obsolete by this new unit. And all these amazing lights shining on that desk lamp showing that it's, it's old and in the way. And it's so funny to think that their threat of technology was presented with just like a computer with a memory, memory, memory. Can process words accounting to in my pixel screen displays for you. Computer graphics locked into your memory, memory, memory. Just imagine if this was written with what we have now with AI technology, deep fakes, robotics. This is, this, I mean, they're not wrong. We have exceeded more and more and more and more. And it's all there to replace the experience of actually sitting on the beach is this comfort. Even what you're doing right now, watching me watch a movie for you. You're not watching it. I'm watching it for you. I'm in the technology. I am the man in the mustache in the old TV. I am not me. I am a picture on your screen talking to you about an experience. And at the end of the song, the, all the new appliances, they just, they just fling them out the window. I mean, look at this shot of the toaster just flung out the window. All the things he's looking for in the cottage that he wants to save are being assassinated. It's wild to sing a song 
to a group of people about how they're obsolete and then throw them out the window. You can see in the dumpster that each of the characters, they are paralyzed by their shock. They've committed so much to getting there. All that work, all that fear they overcome, everything they've gained on their journey is just nil. They don't even care anymore. They're not even fighting. Whatever kind of spirit a toaster has, gone. And they get thrown into Ernie's disposal. TV is the one who can help them. And our little engineering master turns the AC on. And it's so beautiful, actually, that, like, that little bit of caring, you know, can, he feels whole again, and he's happy, and the smile he makes, he wells up, man. You know, there, there's someone in your life, like the air conditioner, who's stuck in the wall, who doesn't know how to ask for help. But the master is a good guy, and he's really distraught himself that these things are missing. Once again, they just miss each other on the road. All the places that our heroes have gone to have gotten more and more kind of desolate as it goes on. You know, the first thing they encountered actual nature. It's almost like they're in the Garden of Eden and then they're cast east of Eden into just the woods. You know, it's still nature, but it's not, there's not that beauty that was once there in the frogs and in the flowers. And they get through the storm and then they can encounter the waterfall and then the chop shop. It's, they're seeing all the worst parts of being an object in our world. Now they're at the final resting place, which is piles of cars like what, what Americans did to the buffalo in the 1800s. Just these absolute stacks of, of cars that were once useful vehicles are just stacked in an absurdly tall scrap metal pile. And the blanket demonstrates his capacity for unconditional love. And he says, I'm glad that the master has great appliances. Do demonstrate a devotional selflessness that is admirable, that they do want to serve the master more than anything else. And here they meet the magnetic um, crane that collects scrap metal at this yard, places it onto a conveyor belt where it is um, compressed into cubes. An absolutely absurd conveyor belt. The mom offers her lamp to him when he shares that it's gone. And he says, well, then how are you going to read? And she says, I'll buy some candles. I won't read or I'll go out as if she can't get another lamp. The TV has an idea to help out his friends. He makes an ad that Ernie's disposal, the junkyard, is a place where you can get cheap new appliances. And our heroes are now just sort of running away from this nonverbal, totally evil magnet. Now we have our final saddest song. All the songs are, are sad except for the first one. It's all these cars singing about their own worthlessness and how at one point they were vibrant, special, fast, happy vehicles and that there's nothing you can do about the, the fact that at one point what seems like a body will become worthless and you will be reduced to a cube. And then when his friend suggests to go to Rooney's vacuums, Ernie on the TV suggests that their vacuum cleaners are carcinogenic and they found big tumors on rats in studies. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about in this kid's movie about carcinogenic vacuums causing tumors on lab rats? And then he opens up his file cabinet. He says, we got photos to prove it. And all the photos in his file cabinets are just... Big, big tumors on those rats. Ugh. We've got photos to prove it and... Subtle. This one car says, I was... I must confess I'm impressed how I did it. I wonder how close that I came. If you reduce these to people, these are people who feel like they almost made it in life, but made some critical error or just at one point weren't enough, so therefore they are worthless. worthless. And the film does nothing to redeem them. And one of them, in, in a very strange car, like toward the end of the song, he talks about working in a reservation. And I'm almost like, is he talking about the Native American community? Is he talking about how they were cast out, the way that these cars were seen as obsolete, like their culture was obsolete for the, you know, modern civilization that chose to wipe them out and to deem them worthless when they still were just as good as anyone else. It's a very interesting reference. And then the master shows up to save them. He goes in anyways. And at the same time, our heroes are attached to this uh, magnet, accepting their fate and death. And fate hath brought them together in this, um, magical way in the worst of times when things become their darkest that's when the savior appears and then the strangest thing happens the blankets picture was there and he dropped it and the guy finds a picture of himself as a child in the junkyard which is really a crazy thing to do and they put themselves in a pile to attract him and they get placed on the conveyor belt the magnet doesn't want them to live ruthless slave of obsolescence he gets confused and angry if anything the magnet is just jealous that they someone wants them because 
the magnet is bypassing tons of valuable scrap metal in the form of cars just to get these guys onto the conveyor belt. And he's looking at it, the master, and he starts to find his things. The magnet picks him up and everything turns red on screen. His life is threatened. He is trapped under the metal. He is, he cannot get out. In order to save the master, the toaster throws himself into the gears of the machine that's destroying everything, that's just sucking him up. Absolute fear, absolute panic. To watch this in the morning while having orange juice, to experience this kind of fear and stress and then have to go learn addition tables is pretty intense. But the toaster throws himself into the gears of the machine, sacrificing his body and life for the safety of his master. The next scene we see that they're all at home with the master in his bedroom and he's at his drafting table repairing the toaster. And miraculously, he fixes it because the master cares about his stuff. An amazing TikTok I saw about a toaster throwing himself into the gears that it's like... There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. You have to throw yourself into the gears of capitalism. I don't know, I'll, I'll roll it. And then there's sort of a sign off from the radio that he wishes all of us the best of like best of luck and health, which is kind of to the viewer, and then the, the vacuum calls it a whole bunch of junk. Hey, atop the Ritz, we wish our intrepid little friends the best of luck and a fond farewell. Yeah, you're all a bunch of junk. I don't know. I don't know what any of this means, so let me know in the comments. And then that's it. And then the movie's over. It has a happy ending. Everything works out in the end. But they, the amount of pain, suffering, fear that these characters go through is immense. And it's really stressful, I think, for a kid to go through. Because when you watch a movie, you, you, you have the mirror neurons. You're going through it. Um, this movie is an absolute masterpiece in terms of its animation, its art. And I do think that the script was written by a man who knew how to write and who knew how to get characters. Why he chose to do this, I'm not exactly sure. What was his name? We know now that what you watch and what you eat and what you listen to affects your nervous system at large. And for a sensitive kid to watch this in the morning, yeah, it may have given me ADD. I don't know. But now let's take a look at this guy. So Thomas Dish is the writer of The Brave Little Toaster. He was a science fiction writer. In the 60s, he started in those science fiction magazines writing. He wrote something called The Genocides, Camp Concentration. The Genocides, which is a genocide of humans by aliens who seed Earth with gigantic plants. Camp Concentration is a science fiction about someone who's sent to a secret military camp where prisoners were injected with syphilis to make them geniuses. So this guy's clearly very intelligent, but he also has an inkling towards darkness. His other novel, 334, which is about um, new technological advances except for medical techniques and recreational drugs, talks about a future in which overpopulation has made housing and other resources scarce, and there is a program of compulsory birth control and eugenics and a welfare state provides for basic needs to an all-encompassing agency called Modicum. But there's an extreme class division between welfare recipients and professionals. So it's about class struggle, technology. So this is obviously something on his mind was the novel 334 is divided into uh, novellas, which is the death of Socrates, bodies, everyday life in the later Roman Empire, emancipation, and Angulame, a group of highly educated prepubescent children decide to commit a gratuitous murder in Battery Park. Thomas Dish is someone who who has a powerful brain, but writes in the dark. Uh, he was born in 1940 and he was homeschooled. He skipped kindergarten from second grade. He went to Catholic school. He developed a love for science fiction, drama, and poetry. After graduating high school, he had a job as a draftsman for a steel plant. He saved enough money to get to New York and he got an apartment and began to, as his Wikipedia says, cast his energy in many directions. He worked as an extra at the Opera House. He was in the production of Spartacus and he was in all kinds of ballets and Don Giovanni at the Metropolitan opera. He worked at a bookstore, a newspaper, and then at 18, oh my god, when he was 18 he tried to take his own life by putting himself in the gas oven, but survived because he didn't have enough money to pay the bill. 
Later that year, he enlisted in the army. General incompatibility with the army resulted in a three-month commitment to a mental hospital. After he was discharged from the army, he returned to New York and continued to pursue the art, and eventually he got a job with an insurance company. He joined the Cooper Union, which is the advance, a union for the advancement of science and arts, a private college. He got the highest score ever on the entrance exams, and he dropped out after a few weeks. He went to night school, where he took classes on writing utopian fiction. He decided to write a short story instead of studying for his midterms. And then he sold the story he wrote, Double Timer. And then he stopped going to classes. He was so compelled to write, he decided to be a writer. So he, would get, he got jobs as a mortuary assistant, a bank teller, a copy editor. And yes, I am just breaking down his Wikipedia for you. It's easier than you reading it. If you want to read it, it's there. Because this is, it's such an amazing story. And he's clearly a person who put his pain in that story. You know, someone, the taking of one's own life was a theme that's common it comes up three or four times in the Brave Little Toaster, in the oven. He was going into the appliances to ask for his, almost in the end, the way the appliances were heading into the smusher, into the open door. He had put himself there. When you look at the master on the conveyor belt, that's almost, it's too parallel and it's so tragic. And once he got some money, he kind of just traveled. He lived in England and Spain and Rome and Mexico. And then he lived for the, the next 20 years of his life living in Union Square. He described himself as someone who knows what he wants to do and is so busy doing it that he doesn't have much time for anything else. He wrote science fiction novels, stories, gothic works, criticisms and plays, a libretto for an opera of Frankenstein, prose and verse children books, 10 poetry collections, and in 1980 he moved from science fiction to horror. He became an artist in residence at the College of William and Mary. He felt that because he was a science fiction writer, he would never be appreciated as sort of like a literary person because science fiction and genre fiction are seen as like a, not as pretentious as straight literature. He was friends with Philip K. Dick, but then they kind of had a rivalry. Philip K. Dick wrote a letter to the FBI that said he was suggested he was part of a covert organization. What? Here's the quote from... Philip K. Dick's letter to the FBI. The reason why I'm contacting you about this is now that it appears that other science fiction writers may have been so approached by other members of this obviously anti-American organization and may have yielded to the threats and deceitful statements such as were used on me. Therefore, I would like to give you any and all information and help in regarding this, and I ask that your nearest office contact me as soon as possible. I stress the urgency of this because within the last three days I've come across a well-distributed science fiction novel which contains the essence of vital material which this individual confronted Daddy, with Daddy. me. Yeah. Tea party's ready. Okay, I'll be down in a minute. Which this individual confronted with me as the basis for encoding. The novel is Camp Concentration by Thomas Dish which was pub published by Doubleday and Company. P.S. I would like to add, what alarms me the most is that the covert organization which approached me may be neo-Nazi, although I, it did not identify itself as being such. My novels are extremely anti-Nazi. I heard only one core code identification by this individual, Solar Con 6. So this is like Philip K. Dick's absolute, like, paranoid writing. I'm going to go out on a hunch and say, did Philip K. Dick take amphetamines? He did take amphetamines. He took amphetamines like M&Ms to the point of actually keeping them in a bowl in his kitchen. Because ladies and gentlemen, in case you haven't looked at the rest of my account, I took a lot of amphetamines as prescribed for ADHD. And yeah, I, I on enough Adderall, I may have written letters to the FBI warning them about the sign I saw in a book if I was in this position. So Philip K. Dick, <clears throat> we're not gonna go too far into his life. We're gonna get back to Thomas Dish. Dish did ironically win the Philip K. Dick Award, and he got revenge on Philip K. Dick in his book called The Word of God, where Philip K. Dick is dead and living in hell, unable to write because of writer's block. And um, in the novel, Philip K. Dick gets a taste for human blood, which unlocks his ability to write and makes a deal to go back in time. These are, these are crazy messed up stories, which, but I can't imagine executives at Disney looking at this resume and saying, yeah, why don't you write a book for kids? He lived with his partner of 30 years, Charles Naylor, in Manhattan. In 2005, his partner died, and he had a rent-controlled Manhattan apartment. And there were many attempts to um, evict him. And eventually, he did lose that apartment, shortly after living also his, his life partner. Uh, he became highly depressed, and he wrote on LiveJournal um, website from April 2006 until he ended his own life with a firearm in 2007. He was an outspoken atheist, 
as well as a satirist. He designed computer games. He worked in the theater. Um, the Brave Little Toaster was originally a novella that was found in a fantasy and science fiction. In the book, the Daisy speaks verse and does declare its love for the toaster, having fallen in love with its reflection. In the book, the Daisy says, Pluck me and take me where you're bound. I cannot live with you here. Then let your bosom be my buyer. In the book, the squirrels ask what gender the appliances are. And they explain that they are, they are genderless, followed by an exchange of inappropriate jokes, which no one in the group find funny. So forgive me for gendering them. They are all they them. Looking at the summary of the book, they discover a boat, and the toaster objects to the boat, saying it makes them no better pirates who are the banes of an appliance existence. Since one appliance has been spirited away by a pirate, it has no choice but to serve its bidding, just as though it were the appliance's legitimate master. What? Truly there is no fate, even obsolescence, so terrible as falling in the hands of pirates. The story of Thomas Dish is tragic, and it, it always upsets me when, when people take their own lives. It makes me sad. And it's absolutely tragic. Rest in peace, Thomas Dish. Uh, let me know what you think of The Brave Little Toaster, and if there was any movie when you were a kid that you watched every day that you think had an effect on the development of you personally, because this one had an effect on me.